start with the structure. Our students come to us because they think that we are the ticket to a good job. And they are told this by their parents and their family and maybe their teachers. Uh, why work hard in school? Why uh, succeed uh, academically? Because you'll get into a good university. Why get into a good university? Because that will give you a head start in school. And, uh, and the advantage of getting into a good university is that it's a lifelong attachment. Uh, I'm a graduate of Princeton. I got my PhD from Harvard. When I say these words, everybody starts nodding, you know, you know, good schools and so forth. I know as a professional academic that there are probably a thousand, maybe 10,000 schools around the world that can provide as good an education as the two institutions I went, went to. But I also know that those names will open up the door for me. They may not let me succeed, and maybe somebody from a small community college will end up being the chancellor or CEO of a company, but they will open the door, and this is what parents want to provide for their children, this door opening effect. And it's what we want to provide in our attempts to be a quality institution, because once you are a graduate of our institution, then you are a graduate for life, and you have this symbiotic relationship. So, students, parents, they want results. And so they look at the professional schools and they say, engineering provides good jobs. You're good at math, son, be an engineer. Uh, English doesn't, is kind of hazy. You know, you may love reading, but be an engineer. Uh, business is, is okay, but right now the business environment is down. You know, be an engineer. Uh, so they're very goal directed. And we, in response to that, try to provide very competent professional education on a world-class level. As, and I'm not just boasting about our institution. All institutions want to do this. This is what we aspire to. We want to do well by our students. Fine. What do we want as an institution? Frankly, we know that all the skills and the information that you learn as an engineer or as a physician, perhaps a pre-med, or as a scientist, it's going to change. And so, you know, the, 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 the concrete methodology you learn as a civil engineer or the, mecha the mechanics that you're going to learn as a mechanical engineer or the mass media, mass, mass communication techniques that you're going to learn if you're a major in mass communication or architecture, these are going to shift. And so what we want to do is to train our students not to shift with them but to be one step ahead, to cause the shift. And for that, you need a separate, a separate framework uh, in terms of education. So what do we want as an institution? We want to train our students to think. How we do it can be in different ways. And, and studying an engineering course or a mass communications course or an architecture course, that's one way. But if the goal is to have them memorize everything that has gone in the past about architecture or electrical engineering, and that's all, then we have failed. We want our students to be able to communicate. Because if they stand up in front of a group like this representing a company, and they sort of mumble like this, and they can't really, you all leave. We want our students to communicate not only verbally, but in writing, because writing is tremendously important as everybody who is now fooling around with their emails on BlackBerry can tell you. We want our students to have initiative. We want them to have confidence that if you say, here's a project, they understand what the beginning is, they can organize themselves, they understand what research is in order to gather the information necessary for the project, all of these things. So the, our goals are slightly different from that of the parent or the, uh, or the student who comes in and says, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an architect. We do it in engineering, we do it in architecture, but the outcomes for us and the way we measure our outcomes are, are quite different. This is important in the structure. 
because if you have a university or if you expect a, a university in higher education to only produce a replication of knowledge, then you have wasted an, a great opportunity. And in this particular region in general, in the Middle East, and I've been living off and on in the Middle East for 40 years, and I've watched higher education, and I'll say this, even though it's taped, most of the state-run institutions, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in Jordan, though Jordan is getting better, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Syria, have failed in this opportunity. Because, and these, these institutions, many of them are very new. Saudi Arabia is another example. Because the idea was, we set up the, the, uh, the, the, the building, we give students the textbook, we give them the teachers to, to help them understand the textbook, and that's it. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So what kind of structure do we need? It doesn't really matter. We just need a structure. I mean, I'm not going to provide a formula. I represent an American model institution, but I'm not going to say the American model is the best model. I'm just saying that you, you have to look at the broader outcomes you want for your students and provide a structure that produces these. And there are many, many ways to do this, and there are many fine institutions that are doing it in different ways. But if you think that replication of knowledge is, is education, it's just it's anti-education almost. It may be learning, but it's not education. So that's number one. Number two, motivation. Last year, I asked our institutional research team to help explain how students do from different schools that are coming into our university. Our students come from the top 20% of their schools. Our entrance requirement is a GPA, straight G high school GPA. We don't do a SAT or any of the international tests. We do TOEFL for English, but that's all. So, we have schools that are excellent, where our students are coming from. We have schools that are medium, and we have schools that are frankly poor. And the goal, my goal for the, uh, asking this question was, how do students do, was that we could provide feedback for the schools, that we could reassure the excellent feeder schools, you're doing a great job, but maybe you could do a little better in math. We could talk to the, uh, the poor schools, frankly and quietly, not make a big public relations thing, but sit down with them and say, you know, you really have to do better by your students, you're failing them, They're, they come in, they take math three, three times and fail it twice and finally succeed. English is a problem. So let's work with you and try to see how you can become better. And with the mixed schools, you know, sometimes we'll say you're doing a great job in one subject and a poor job in another. There was a great, very fine uh, Arabic speaking school in Dubai, uh, a private one, that, you know, since it was in Arabic, their Arabic was great, all the students. Their math was great, their English was poor. So then it's a question of sitting down with them and saying, you know, let's work on English and think about how you can strengthen this to help your students. Fine, what did we find? We found that yes, there were differences and that students had different experiences in the first year of, with us. So as freshmen, many people from, who had weaker backgrounds suffered. They, they struggled to, to finish the English requirement courses, the writing courses. They struggled to, to do the math courses. Sophomore year, they were all the same. These were students who were in the top 20% of their high school class. It didn't matter to them whether they were in a good school, an excellent school, or a poor school. What mattered to them is they wanted to be in the top 20%. And when they came to our institution and found that they were no longer in the top 20%, they worked twice as hard to normalize the situation. And this is a finding that's not only relevant to us, or not only has been discovered for, to, by us, but is well known in elite schools. My own alma mater, Princeton, accepts students from elite private schools in the States and internationally, and also from public schools in places that are not known for the strength of their education. Alabama, Missouri, uh, North Dakota. And yet, when these kids come, they have the same experience. Freshman year is disastrous for them academically. Sophomore year, everything is evened out. In fact, they even do better because everybody who comes from a great school says, oh, college is easy. 
I'm going to slough off. Second year, I'll just, you know, I'll party more. And so their grades go down and the other grades go up. And by junior year, we're all the same. This is the importance of motivation. And it's very important in this region because especially in public school systems, whether in this country or the Gulf or the region as well, there's not enough attention being placed towards not how students do in tests and what knowledge they have, but how are we structuring things so that they are motivated. Because at the university, when they come to us, we expect that motivation and we have it. And because of that motivation, the students are self-starters and they take initiative. So we have this combination that we're fortunate with that we have motivated students and we hope a good structure. Again, there's no perfect way to do this, but if you don't focus on these two ingredients, then in fact, we are betraying the trust of the younger generation. And I think this is something that every society should take very, very seriously. How are we maximizing our, the potential of our most valuable resource, which is the next generation? I mean, we can worry about global warming and so forth, but if everybody is dumb about it when it happens, then where are we going to be? Okay, let me talk about the third thing, serendipity. And I'll delve a little bit into my own uh, experience and my own background, if you permit me, because I'm the perfect example of a college student who had no idea what they wanted to do and who kind of fell into things. When I went to Princeton, it was 1967. This was the 67 war period, and I kind of vaguely remember seeing it on TV, but I can tell you the fact that the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were coming out with new records at that point was a much more important event. But somehow, because of the language requirement at this institution, and because they had an array of languages, then I thought, well, okay, I want to take something different. I don't want to take French or German. Russian I'll look at. So I wandered into the freshman orientation session of what was at that point called Oriental Languages. And I thought, let me take one of these. They had Chinese, they have Japanese, they had Korean, and they had Arabic, Persian, Turkish. So I was standing there, freshman orientation, and this was an evening, and, and the professors were behind these various desks, and they were competing for students, you know, come and take Chinese or something. And I really analyzed critically the situation. I looked at the Chinese line, and there were 25 students standing in line. I looked at the Japanese line. There were 12 students standing in line. I looked at the Korean line, six students. I looked at the other table with this lonely professor that says Arabic, Persian, Turkish, nobody in line. I analyzed the situation and I seized the opportunity. I walked up and said, tell me about Arabic because that came first in the alphabet before Persian and Turkish. And he said, sign here, kid. So I signed there. Four years later, I graduated with a, a degree in Near Eastern Studies. And I had kept on doing it because in the midst of that, and serendipitously, I had found one or two professors that really excited me about Islamic culture, pre-modern medieval Islamic culture. I took the modern courses, and I thought, you know, geez, politics is really depressing. I almost dropped the language. But then some professor met me in the hallway and said, I see you around. Who are you anyway? And I said, well, I'm taking Arabic and I'm in my sophomore year and I think I'll, you know, after this year I'll probably stop. He said, no, no, come, come to my course next semester. And he opened up a whole world. And that shifted my motivation from finishing the, uh, the two-year two language requirement to actually finding out what's going on in the civilization. It opened up a whole world and it really excited me and was one of those aha moments that we as educators and we as parents and we as employers have to provide. We have to provide these aha moments where people say, oh, this is different. I, get, you know, I want to find out what's going on. This is exciting. It can be the, an idea, and this is entrepreneurship, it can be the idea of uh, a new invention, a, a new activity, whatever it is, without that passion, if you don't shift motivation into passion, then we haven't done our job as educators. 
And so we are also looking at our institution of trying to figure out where are those connections being made and are we making them enough? I learned other things, I don't want to go on too long about this, but I fell into academic administration. If you had talked to my high school class or my college roommates, they would have said, this guy, is, you know, he likes these languages and stuff and he's off in the Middle Ages, but, you know, university administrator? What I found, and this is also serendipitous, that I had a knack. My first job teaching was in Birzeit University in the West Bank in the early 80s, and the department I was in needed a department chair. And they had wise people, older professors who had done it and didn't want to do it anymore. And they had a couple people with MAs who weren't qualified to do it. And they had one young gullible fool who was a PhD from Harvard and who spoke some Arabic and they said, okay, we'll stick him in it. And what I found when I did it is that actually I was pretty good. This is the equivalent of learning some, you know, learning how to, being challenged to, to, to win a game of croquet or bowling or something. And you do it and you find out, gee, I can, you know, this is easy. There was a natural knack. And so one thing has led to another and I've pursued the scholarship and I pursued the academic administration until they're kind of combined now. Pure serendipity. So these are the three ingredients that if one is going to take the, the, the title of my talk literally, which is the sky is the limit, these are the three ingredients that we somehow have to track. And serendipity, you know, I've heard of companies being formed in coffee shops because three people get together over a cup of coffee who they don't know each other and maybe in a conference and all of a sudden they have, uh, you know, a company going. These are the elements. The serendipity we can't really control and that's individualized. What we can ask is what happens if people don't have that aha moment and maybe we can structure things so that they can have that moment or we can talk to them to see where they're going. Because I also have one final example and that's my college roommate. My college roommate who was uh, my, at that time my best friend as well and still a good friend, he never had the aha moment. Here was a kid who was a star athlete in Ohio, in wrestling and in football. When he came to college, he found out that he was too small to play football. And he was number four in wrestling in the state championships in Ohio. And who should show up? Number one from Pennsylvania, which is the top wrestling state in the country. So there's no way that he was actually going to do wrestling. He had not studied at all in high school. And he didn't study much in college because he thought the goal was to get through college and not to actually have any aha moments. Lack of motivation. He's gone through his business life being moderately successful in one job after the other and probably taking great satisfaction from his, uh, from his family and, and his surroundings. Last I heard, he was the manager, general manager of a country club where, so that he could play golf as much as he wanted and maybe that was his motivation and his passion. But I always felt that considering how bright this guy was and how gifted he was, we had lost an opportunity. And so I guess my message for us is that we should be not only relying on serendipity, but we should be monitoring motivation and trying to encourage it. And we should provide, be providing the best structures we can, whether it's in the education field, and certainly K through 12, and that's this regard is much more important and much more influential than college, but college is also important, or whether it's in the early workforce when we are mentoring our young people and instead of driving them, we should be thinking about how can we get them to drive us. And with that, thank you very much. I think to answer your question and my comments is, a board is vital to help the company An established. Once you've developed here again, where the underlying message from very text from from the uh, from the, uh, the 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 folks that have spoken is that you need to have a clear. Vision uh, I've, what I've been asked. Right. I've been and, asked if and, there are any questions. We have writing, a little bit of time, in, apparently. In the that that Lara mentioned the yeah. board structure. Uh,
Navdesh. There's a microphone here, so. At the bottom, I think, isn't it? Then you have, you can say, hey. Technical difficulties. Um, uh, um, board. Could I, yes, see, that's the solution. Hello. So, Professor Heath, I, you know, I appreciate what you've been saying uh, mostly about, you know, entrepreneurship and talent, especially the aha moment. So, but uh, here's my question. Most people, by definition, would be average. How do you bring an aha moment for them in uh, our surrounding culture? Well, I, this is an excellent question. And not everybody is going to be in the top 10% or the 20% in terms of motivation or skill level. I mean, not, we don't accept everybody into our universities and, and other universities have the same policy. I think it's, the motivation is the easy part because I think in this case, you don't instill motivation, you provide motivation. And this is what most companies do. They realize that it, for this level of employee, what's important, or they can ask, what is important to you? Is it a, a good job environment? Is it a sense of being part of a team? Is it uh, you know, any one of a number of things? And you look for that as a carrot rather than an internal, uh, you know, internal motivator. On the other hand, I think that once you provide a, the right structure, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, uh, in terms of my own institution, we have 500 non-academic employees. And you know, we have this whole graded thing that one has in HR, grade one to grade 13 or something like this. And what's really important for us, or at least for me, is to make sure that somebody in grade three really feels part of the family of the institution. So that becomes a motivator. And then we look at comparative pay and so forth. But it, it's an excellent question. Uh, not everybody is going to, to be the, the, the CEO or the head of an entrepreneur, uh, of a, you know, a company or something like this. But it's, I think you can find structures and maybe the aha moment is a different modality for, for a number of people. So, but the, you know, if we don't ask the question of how it's going to happen, then we won't, we won't be looking. But oh, one more thing, notice that I put it in the context of structure. And, and this, when we have no structures, Rekin. then Rekin. it's a bigger challenge. And I think this was part of your question. Uh, thank you for this enlightening lecture. I just thought that uh, institutions like uh, Princeton and the Ivy Leagues, uh, they have produced wonderful professionals in finance and in, uh, in banking and the rest of it. In the current phase of our existence, we are seeing so many crises, for example, financial crisis, then they talk of uh, deviant behavior at national level, at communities level. Do you think we are, it would be right to tweak our education system with, uh, with ethics and professional conduct and when professional conduct is not professional conduct so that there is a better dispersion of wealth in the world? and. We have professionals who are then wedded to their own professional ethics and they do, not that they would not do nothing wrong, but then there would be a slight improvement in the corporate behavior that we have seen given WorldCom and the rest of the crises. Yeah. Your views on that as an educationist? Uh, well, I, first of all, I totally agree that, that tweaking is necessary. And I've seen you know, the, the best students in whatever field in, in these schools you know, they can be, they can be fall in love with Spanish literature or, uh, you know, some very specialized artistic aspect of, of their lives. And yet, when they graduate, it's, well, I'm going to go into finance. I'm heading for Wall Street. Why? Because the message is the money, money is important. And this has been, this is a, a, a miss, a misstructure. I mean, go, to go back to the structure analogy. We're not structuring our, our, the framework for what is really important in the world correctly. If it's, if it's individual success, then, uh, then that's fine up to a limit. But let me give you, I would be even go further in terms of the responsibility of an institution like ours. I once heard a lecture from Muhammad Yunus who d developed the whole micro banking system in Bangladesh first and it spread around the world. And he made one simple point. He said, we have the resources right now that we can eliminate poverty in the world. We don't have the structure to do it, 
but there's no question that we have the resources. Will everybody have a McMansion and live in a big house as a consequence and be able to use enormous amounts of energy and have a great car? No. But there's no reason at all that one-third of the children of this planet should go to bed hungry most nights. We know this intellectually, but because of the structures we have and the motivation system we have, it's not important. It's important maybe to go to Mars. It's important maybe to do many things. It's important that, that the stock market go up you know, without end. But that somehow is not important. So it's a radical shift that, that one really needs of priorities, not just a, a, a tweaking. President Teeth, uh, you mentioned that students coming from different schools uh, have uh, a lot of variations among their academic uh, preparation. So how do you deal with this practically in the classrooms when you have people coming with different levels of uh, academic preparations and all of them in the same class? Okay. Well, well, first of all, I mean, we don't have the problem that a, either a public university or a public school has because we are selected. And the fact is that, that we're taking the top 20% of, of any student in, in their class. And so it's simpler for us because it's a matter of filling in the gaps. And Uh, and we have systems of, of you know, uh, when somebody, a kid goes on probation, we, we fill in the gaps. How to do it on a social level, it's, it's education has swung back and forth. Again, I'll use a personal example. I, I ended up in a public school in New York City when I was 13. And they, had, they, they believed in the stratified system at that point. So they had grade, you know, grade 8, 1, 2, 24. I felt, somehow I fell in number 4. And the next year, I was going to go up to number one or two. Others of my classmates, who I thought were, were fine as kids, were going back to number 17. That went out of fashion. And the fashion shifted the other way. Let's stick everybody together. And the, one of the weaknesses of education is that it, they just, of the educational theory and methodology, is a, a kind of amnesia that goes on, a kind of fadism. And so I think you know, one should sit back. I mean, this is my own pragmatic point of view. One should sit back and look at the particular culture we're in, what motivates, what succeeds, and so forth, and take it from there very slowly instead of assuming that the fad of today is, uh, is, is uh, going to be better. It's simpler for us at the university, and we're going, to found, we're going to create a school, and it will be simpler for that school because the school will also be selective. The real challenge, and I think this is what you pointed out, is what to do with the other 80%. And I think we can do things, but it requires work and thought. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you for your questions. They were great.